Alrighty, we are the Hash Slinging Slashers, and the purpose of today's video is to show you the North Shore Extension train simulation project that we built for our software engineering course. So what you see in front of you is our main overall GUI, which is basically a GUI of GUIs, and abstracted behind it are all of the individual interfaces for every module that was implemented for this system. And those modules include the CTC, the Wayside Controller, the Track Model, the Train Model, the Train Controller, and the moving block overlay. So in this video, we'll walk through each one, what they each do, and how to use each module, uh, starting with the CTC. So the purpose of the CTC is to create train schedules and also monitor the status of trains on the track. Uh, so on the left, we have where we can create a schedule. Uh, in the middle, we're able to see the queue of trains waiting to be dispatched and edit their respective schedules. And on the right-hand side, we're able to monitor currently dispatched trains. Uh, lastly, at the bottom, we're able to look at each block of the track, uh, toggling switches, uh, causing maintenance to occur, repairing blocks, uh, viewing occupancy status, and also launching wayside GUIs. So I'm going to start out with importing trains. Uh, there's two main ways to do it. Uh, one is an automatic import of a schedule. Uh, this one in particular was exported by the MBO, and it contained two trains as seen here. So the next option is to do a manual creation of a train. So I'll create the train green one, and we're going to depart at 7.01 AM, so just after 7. And we're going to send it to stop A2. Uh, the dwell time automatically populates with two minutes. So when we reach a station, we're going to spend two minutes there before continuing. Uh, and we have a predicted time to reach that station, also automatically calculated. Uh, so we're going to start out showing fixed block mode and add the train to the queue. Uh, so you can see the train in here. We can start our simulation. Uh, our simulation works up to 50 times speed. So I'm going to speed up a little bit closer to 701. And also launch the track model. So the track model shows a overall view of the track uh, and where the train is on the system. So as 701 rolls around, we should be able to see that a train is automatically dispatched from the yard. Uh, so this window that just popped up is a train model. It shows the current speed, the authority of that train, um, and we can use it to verify that the CTC is doing what it should at the moment. Uh, so within the CTC, we see our train uh, has this schedule right here. We can add stops to it, remove stops as we wish. Uh, we see that it's on block K68 right now uh, and currently moving. Uh, we're sending a suggested speed of uh, about 37 miles per hour, and we're supplying this authority to the train. Uh, we're able to manually suggest the speed. Let's say if we want it to travel 10 miles per hour, we click send, and we see that the speed reaching the train is now about 10 miles per hour. So we're going to go ahead and Let's undo that manual override, let the train speed up, and travel its way to the station. So A2 is right here, and when the train reaches, it will slow to a stop, and passengers will board. So we see that 70 passengers got on. Uh, we have a throughput calculation, so that's 70 passengers over just over six minutes, which comes out to about 650 passengers per hour. Next, we're going to show uh, performing maintenance on blocks. So let's take C8, for instance. We select block C8 within the CTC, and we're able to close it for maintenance. And you can e see that reflected in the track model. If we navigate to it, we see all the failures going off. And let's send the train heading in harm's way. As you see, uh, as the train approached the block that's under maintenance, it slowed to a stop and stopped well before the maintenance uh, block. And if we repair the block, undo that maintenance, we can see the train starts traveling on its way. So the train rounds the corner. The last feature that I want to show is the manual toggling of switches, uh, which occurs using this. So we have A1 selected, which is this block right here. 
and we're able to toggle a switch back and forth. Okay, so as that train approaches the yard, it's going to go away and we're ready to show the next module. So we're going to move on to the track module, track model, which is shown right here. Uh, so this shows a great overview of the track and what's currently going on uh, everywhere on it. Uh, so we have indicator lights, which are green for go, red for stop. Uh, we have stations, uh, which are these blocks here, as well as beacons at both sides of the station. Uh, beacons are what tell the train what station it's approaching, uh, as well as which uh, switch it's taking. We also have crossings up here, and I'll also show the red line, uh, which is also functional. Uh, just more indicator lights, stations, beacons, switches, and crossings. So using the track model, we can navigate around, uh, choose any block we wish. Uh, let's go to A1. Uh, so we're able to toggle a rail failure, which will show up as occupied here. And on the CTC, it's also worth mentioning that it shows up as broken because a train was not detected on that block. Um, and it also shows up as occupied. If we undo that and we move to a power failure, we see that the light goes out because the power failed. And we can also do a track circuit failure. So if we toggle that on, the track circuit will no longer allow that switch to toggle. So no matter how hard the CTC tries, the block will not toggle the switch. So let's fix the track and dispatch another train. So within the CTC, I got a little redundant dispatching a train over and over. So we implemented two test buttons here, uh, one for the green line, one for the red line. We call it our just do it button. So if we click just do it on the green line, a train automatically dispatches and it's automatically assigned this schedule uh, stopping at T105, which is right about here, uh, U114, this stop here, and A2, this stop up here. So these were just three randomly selected blocks that show a good uh, overview of the train traversing the system and I'll be using the just do it button to demo the functionality of the rest of the modules. So I'm going to go to U114, which is our station. Uh, so as the train is approaching, we see that there's 98 waiting passengers for this train. So the train's going to make a brief stop at T105, as dictated by the schedule, and head on its way to the stop. When the train stops, we see that uh, we have 98 passengers get on, zero getting off because the train was originally empty. And we also see the station name here conveniently shown. It's also worth noting that we see that this block is a station, it's occupied, and as the train travels, uh, occupancy is properly shown. Traveling to a switch block. Such as this one here. We can see the switch state change. And the train will make its way around the track. Last thing to point out here is if all those features were confusing and you don't know what these symbols mean, we also have a legend. Uh, and also very helpful, uh, if you hover over the track, uh, we can see what very essential blocks are. So we have uh, switches up here, D13, uh, I57. Uh, these are all the switches of the track uh, to make it easy to navigate around for the user. So next we want to show a wayside controller. So the wayside uh, sits between the CTC and the track model. And one of its main functionalities is to transmit a safe speed and authority. Uh, both of these done, both of these were done with a triply redundant uh, algorithm to confirm that the speed and authority were within safe limits. I'm going to launch both waysides. So this is G1 and G2. So there's two waysides on the green line. Uh, they each have a respective portion of blocks that they're responsible for. Uh, so this one starts with 54, this one starts with 1. And we're going to go ahead and launch a train. So 
So I'm going to go ahead and select block 85, which you see right here. And we're going to observe the switch state change as the train crosses it. So as our train is traveling, we see that the switch is currently in the wrong position, and now it is in the right position. So that's the PLC logic, uh, applying that. As the train travels around, we'll see the switch goes back to the correct location and goes on its way. Uh, it's also important to notice these indicator lights changed. Uh, this one is currently red because this bi-directional stretch of track is currently occupied. Uh, so another train heading in the other direction uh, cannot go on that path. So our train is currently dwelling. And let me select block 19, which is this traffic crossing right up here. Alrighty, so as the train approaches the traffic crossing, we should see this crossing light up as the train crosses through. Just like so. So all of the crossings, all of the lights, all the switch states, that's all automatic logic performed with the PLC. And different PLC code can be imported, such as uh, this one, which is invert crossing. So this takes the logic that is currently there for all the crossings and inverts it. So instead of if train, then cross, then turn on the crossing, we're going to turn it into if no train, then turn on the crossing. So we're going to open that up and we see that it worked. So now we have the crossing as shown. Let me just restore the PLC back to the one that the system was initialized with, and we are back where we were. Okay, so our train starts going again. Uh, it's also nice to point out the occupancy changes to true when a train is on the track. And the crossing will turn off when the train is one block away from the crossing. And we'll let that finish. So the last feature to show of the Wayside controller is the manual mode, which is done through the CTC because we imagine that there's some sort of Wayside engineer who is not sitting next to the Wayside on the track, but rather he's in the central office uh, monitoring the Waysides and also sending manual commands. So we're going to turn manual mode to true, which we see reflected here. And let's go to block 85, which is this switch right here. So we're able to toggle the switch and let's toggle it in the wrong position. So in manual mode, the uh, PLC for the switch is ignored um, and the train, let's send a train its way. So when the train gets here, uh, by switching it to manual mode, the switch will not automatically switch, which poses a dangerous situation for our train. So as we see, the switch has not switched, which indicates that the train cannot proceed. If we toggle the switch back and turn off manual mode, the train starts up again. All right, we're gonna let that go to the end and we will move on to our next module. So our next model to show is the train model. So I'm going to launch a train and we're going to select that train from our main GUI. So this is our train model. Uh, we can see the specifications about the train as well as the authority, the speed, the power being sent from the controller, um, as well as statuses of the doors, the lights, and antennae. Uh, we also have advertisements. These would be playing in the train. They cycle every now and then. And we can demo a emergency brake on this train. So I just clicked emergency brake, train came to an immediate halt, and is waiting for it to be released. So the way to release it is to go to the train controller, uh, switch it to manual mode, and turn off the emergency brake. And now we see the train starting back up again. 
Next we can uh, cause different types of failures on the train. So we will start out with a signal failure. And again, that brings the train to a stop. Uh, we see that the antenna have lost their connections. Uh, so we no longer have a GPS and MBO because this is a signal failure. We've lost our signal. Um, we, to fix this, we end it. And then again, we have to go back to the controller and turn off the emergency brakes. And the train continues. Okay. Next failure we can show, we'll just show one more, is a brake failure. So as the train is moving, we're going to cause a failure, which again brings it to a complete stop. Uh, we see that the emergency brake has been turned on, so we're going to turn it off again. Oh, end the failure. And the train starts back up again. So as you see, we are approaching Mount Lebanon. And now we are at Glenbury. So we see that 97 passengers got onto the train that's reflected here. Uh, the doors were only open momentarily so that the passengers could get on or off. And we can launch a second train just to show switching between the GUIs. So we also have a train four that we can also have up simultaneously. Okay, we're going to let the trains run their course and proceed to the next module. Oops, I had it in manual driving mode and that's why it was not running. As the trains return, their GUIs go away. So next up to highlight is our train controller, which is shown here. So the main GUI that we see uh, allows a train engineer to apply a P and I values for calculating uh, what speed to give to the train, uh, which is especially important when we are speeding up and slowing down so that we reach uh, our optimal speed. We're going to go ahead and launch a train with our just do it button. And we can view that train on the GUI like so. So it's traveling right now. We can switch it to manual mode. Uh, suggest new speeds. Let's slow it down a little bit, maybe 10. Set a new speed, and you see we're decreasing speed to our new set point of 10. And notice how when we're slowing down, there's no power output until we get nearby. So we'll switch it back to auto mode. So the power calculation within the train controller is safety critical. Um, it's calculated redundantly three times and the minimum power is selected. Uh, these being trains, uh, turning the train off is a valid solution unlike an airplane. Um, so we just slow down the train uh, if there is a problem with the calculations. We'll let our train go. It will stop at T105. Uh, we're not at a stop, so the doors have not opened. And we arrive at our station. So we see that the right doors have opened because the station has doors on the right-hand side. And it's currently dwelling, letting passengers come on.
The train proceeds, and in underground stretches, the lights turn on. You can notice that toggling on and off as the train goes. Here we have our left doors open. And the train continues to the end. Okay, so now we will move on to our last module, which is the MBO. And this is the main MBO GUI shown here. So I'm actually going to have to relaunch this simulation uh, because we started in fixed block mode, but now we want to be in moving block mode where we can have two trains occupying the same stretch of blocks. Um, so this is something, once we press the play button in the very beginning, that is an unchangeable option. So I'm going to close out of here and restart from our jar file. Okay, so I'm going to select moving block mode and let me get our track model on here so we can visualize what's happening and we're going to launch a train. So we see that the train was launched and we're getting a signal from the train. Uh, this is the most recently uh, received signal which is used to detect the distance that the train travels in a certain amount of time. Uh, so it's re receiving the coordinates via GPS uh, calculating a current location based on those pixel coordinates, and then also calculating a velocity and safe braking distance. You can also see we have moving block mode enabled here. So all the calculations here are triply redundant uh, as well because it is a safety critical system. Uh, so it's performed three times. Uh, a voting mechanism is used uh, so if two of them agree and one of them doesn't, uh, the value that is sent are the two that agree with each other. And then a checksum is also sent to the train. So along with the speed and authority, uh, the train receives a checksum, uh, which allows the train to verify that the data was not corrupted via transmission. Okay, we're going to let this train just travel through. And we're going to show launching two trains at the same time to show the true functionality of the MBO. Okay, so now we're going to click just do it twice, back to back. So since the yard is occupied, the second one hasn't dispatched yet. Once this one leaves, another train isn't too far behind. So we see, uh, now that there's two trains, we're calculating authority. And the train in the back has a much shorter authority than the one in the front because it cannot travel through this train on its way. So this one's authority is to train one. So our trains travel. You notice that they stop. And in this mode, the MBO is in charge of calculating safe braking distance. So what we should see here is train one is at Glenbury. We should also see train two also uh, travel to Glenbury. So both of those trains do fit on the station. And notice they are both on U114 Glenbury now and are currently dwelling. So they both picked up a different number of passengers. And having two trains simultaneously on the same block is not possible in fixed block mode. That's when the CTC is ascending authority. Um, it's, this is something that's only possible in moving block mode. And our trains travel around. It's also worth showing uh, another feature of the MBO is to create schedules. Uh, so you can enter a train name, start time, stop time, as well as operators. And what it will generate is a schedule with all of the stations scheduled in. Uh, so I'm going to open up a sample CSV and we have two of our favorite Spongebob characters here, Patrick and Sandy. They each have a respective train. Uh, this one leaving at one second after the hour, this one leaving at three seconds after, or at 30 seconds after the hour. And we have the blocks that they're stopping at as well as the time to dwell. 
So that's it in terms of our modules. Uh, as a fun last thing, we should just stress test the system a little bit. So I'm going to launch it again in fixed block mode and just show you a few different trains getting on the track to highlight that the system does work and trains never touch. Okay, I just click the button four times and we see each one dispatching, following behind the other, uh, wind safe. Uh, notice this indicator light is red because the bidirectional stretch is occupied. As soon as it's unoccupied, the next train begins to move through. Just like so. And again, we're in fixed block mode, so two trains cannot be on the same block in this mode. That's why this train stopped behind train zero. Okay, and the very last thing, we're gonna switch it to the red line and just show one train traveling across that. So we dispatch one train. Uh, I use the red just do it button. So if we look at the red trains, uh, it's gonna stop at H45, which is approximately right here, then L60, which is the station right here, uh, and then S75, which is a arbitrary block on this protrusion. We can speed up. Train travels, gets to H45, stops at the station, identical to the green line. It's just different stops and a different track structure. Train travels around, we stop at S75. And we successfully make our way back to the yard. Alrighty, so that is it for us here at uh, the Hashling Slashers. Uh, we certainly had a great time doing this project, and we really hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you.